since about two and a half years are handheld uh, spectrometers and primarily near infrared spectrometers. So market research institutions uh, predict uh, these, this segment of instrumentation uh, a bright future. The growth is based on a wider adoption of these handheld spectrometers for in the field measurements, implementation in uh, industrial processes, for instance, here mounting it on a V blender or using it at home for food testing. Uh, just a very quick historic overview. Many of you were not born at this time. I was working with this infrared spectrometer when I worked at Bayer many, many years ago. So it needed a room, a separate room. Same with Raman spectrometers. And in the course of the years, the instruments were shrinking in size and weight. So this is also quite an old instrument, an NIR, Bruger NIR instrument with, with light fiber connected probes for transmission and, uh, well, transmission and uh, diffuse reflection. Uh, Another uh, 10 years later, it was shrinking further. This is a Broca Alpha. It is, uh, has quite a high modularity in so far as you can exchange this part of the instrument with an ATR adapter or with an external reflection module. In about 2010, the, the mini laboratory for vibrational spectroscopy looked like this. So this was an FDIR, this was a near infrared. It's already outdated because it's a... Pardon me? Did, did you want to interfere? My... Yes. <laughs> so I will speak now two hours. <laughs> it's for voice. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's everything okay? No, no problem. <laughs> this was a near infrared spectrometer, and this was a Raman spectrometer. Examples of miniaturized vibrational spectrometers in 2020. So this is FDIR, it's about like the palm of your hand. This is Raman, like an old telephone receiver. This is an FDIR and then a Raman instrument and they have been, have been merged in one instrument by Thermo. It's about one and a half kilo, but it's very expensive. And this is one of the many different NIR instruments. It weighs 160 grams you hold it like a, a little torch. So for the Raman instruments, you have a variety of applications. So you have either 785 or 1064 nanometer excitation. You use the NIR excitation in order to suppress fluorescence, which is a big problem. Uh, you have op uh, orbital raster scanning where the instrument can rotate the focus of the Raman beam if you investigate a homogeneous material in order to compensate this uh, heterogeneity. Because if you focus on a, very, uh, on a very small area only, you may not be really representative for this area. You have surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy where your sample has to be in contact with a silver or gold surface in order to enhance the signals and you can come down to the PPP level. The weight is larger than one kilo and infrared uh, is uh, in FDIR for ATR, attenuated total reflection, uh, diffuse and regular reflection. Price is much higher than about $10,000 of these different instruments. 
And now comes the, the difference with, with NIR. They are built on different monochromator principles like linear variable, uh, variable filter, uh, digital mirror device from Texas Instruments, uh, the Fabry Perot Univer filter, Fourier transform or grating instruments for diffuser reflection and transflection, primarily. Their weight is almost in all cases smaller than 100 grams. And the price is smaller than 10,000 K. Actually, it has gone down to a couple of thousand K. And if you buy in larger amounts to a couple of, uh, of, of 100 uh, US dollars. So Raman and I are due to uh, the high price uh, is uh, restricted to industrial, military, homeland security, applications and public uh, use uh, by first responders, law enforcement and environmental institutions. Oh, okay. oh, here it is. Uh, NIR, due to the much lower price, it, will, it becomes interesting for everyday people for everyday use by customers like you and me at home, housewives when they go shopping, etc. And I will show you some examples of this. The problem, however, you, you how, how do I get rid of this? Okay. Uh, the problem uh, of this development is that uh, direct to consumer companies realize a market and they come up with advertising videos where they promise a lot. They promise things they cannot really, uh, which are unrealistic. And people may buy such an instrument for a couple of hundred dollars, may try to use it and eventually it disappears uh, somewhere uh, in the basement and uh, they are disappointed not only about this instrument, they are disappointed about the technique and this is even worse. So realistic applications are on site law enforcement, drugs, custom investigations, industrial uh, sensor implementation in processes. You have seen the small instrument mounted on the V-blender and while the blender rotates, the instrument measures the material which falls on the sapphire window and tells the operator when the material is homogeneous. Real-time control of blend homogeneity, as I pointed out, identity control of pharmaceutical formulations, exploration of geological test samples, for instance, bauxit, I will show you an example, uh, remediation or exploration of soil, uh, total petroleum hydrogen. We have a very large project with Chevron at the moment where we use handheld spectroscopy in order to detect uh, total petroleum hydrogen in soil down to the PPN web. Identification or discrimination of polymers for recycling purposes and public or non expert interests, authentication of a broad range of products textiles, carpets, pharmaceuticals, food testing and authentication, seafood, uh, spices, oil, milk powder, or nutritional parameters, it's, it's hidden in, yeah, I cannot, uh, where we measure energy, protein, ash, etc. cetera, uh, in a realistic accuracy. And now I come to my special overhead for Alexander. Alexander said uh, <laughs> the absorption bands in near infrared spectroscopy are broad. Now, yeah, if I look at these absorption bands, these are three different compounds a, a full psychoelephantic compound, a full aromatic compound, and a mixed compound. But if I look at the compound, I must say these absorption bands are not at all uh, broad. He said it's unspecific. Okay, let's see. He tried to 
a sign or absorption bands. So I, I would not really say that it's an unspecific method. I agree with him that it's of low specificity in so far as it focuses on CH, NH, OH, carbonyl, maybe he said SH, but SH is a, not a very intense band. So uh, in total, I would say, especially I recommend a book from Bergman and Weyer. It's an atlas for new infrared spectroscopy with assignment of uh, absorption bands over the whole near infrared range. It has an additional feature. This is uh, the spectrum of a ketone mixture with 5% water. The additional feature is that, first of all, you can assign all bands. So again, specificity, low, no. But the real advantage is that all near infrared spectra have this intensity course coming from the mid infrared on the right to the visible on the left. What is the advantage of this effect? You can choose those absorption bands which, which fit your thickness. Because, of course, if you work with the left range here, and for instance, the petrochemical industry works. Do I make something wrong? Okay, I, 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 sorry, I stay here. I stay here. <laughs> so the petrochemical company uses the range at the left because they can work with much larger thicknesses, up to millimeter, centimeter. So depending on what you want to investigate and how convenient it is for you to work with small or how inconvenient it is to work with uh, small uh, sicknesses, you just select the region of interest. Now I go quickly uh, through those instruments and their principles uh, of uh, monochromators and detectors which are available today and which we have tested. So this is a VRV, it's built on a linear variable filter, where this filter selects, the, it's a batch-like structure, and depending where the polychromatic radiation hits, only selected wavelengths are allowed to go through. I've also put in the wave number range, uh, the spectral resolution, and we measured also the signal-to-noise ratio. So this is an instrument which is based on the Texas Instruments. It's many small micro mirrors which can be flipped for 12 degrees and depending on how uh, uh, mirrors are flipped, the polychromatic radiation which is dispersed by a grating and falls on this DND and a selective wavelengths are reflected to a single detector, which is much cheaper than a detector array. So this is a, a fabri perot tunable filter, where depending on the movement of, the, uh, of this uh, gap, uh, only selective wavelength ranges are allowed to go through. They offer four instruments in different wavelength ranges. So if you want to cover the whole NIR range, you have to buy four instruments. This is Cyber Systems, it's a microelectromechanical system, FTNIR. It's an Egyptian company. I've visited them. I did not, I could, it was difficult for me to imagine such a high tech instrument, but it's true. Uh, they came out with a new scanner, and this is a really a very good instrument because it's very handy. It's a little bit heavier than the other one but it's very good. So what they do basically, they develop such an interferometer, a Michelson interferometer, or many of these Michelson interferometers uh, as uh, monolithic uh, chips on a, a silicon layer. And they, they cover a relatively large wavelength range. It's probably the handheld instrument with the largest wavelength range from 1200 to 2500 uh, nanometers. Then Hamamatsu has come up with an FTIR MEMS, FTNIR South NES technology, MEMS FTNIR. This is the advantage if you cooperate with an Asian uh, colleague because he has access to all these instruments. Uh, then there is, this is a very new instrument from a German company. It's based on 16 solar cells as detectors. 
it has a very limited range. So signal to noise ratio is intermediate, uh, and but it will be very cheap. This is also a German instrument based on a grating. And this is a Taiwanese instrument, OTO photonics, also based on a grating. Now I show you one of these advertisements. PISF or an outsourced little company of PISF is promising since a long time uh, that they will come on the market with the so-called Herzstück. It's an instrument with a relatively large uh, wavelength range from 1000 to 3000 nanometer. Actually, it extends into the mid infrared, which is quite interesting. And this is a typical way of advertising. You can implement it in the, in the mobile phone, and then you can measure the, uh, uh, the nutritional parameters of your food. Yeah, so far, uh, I have not seen anything. Let me start off with an industrial application. It's uh, the cooperation with Chevron. They, uh, they sent us uh, soil from different sites with different amounts of uh, total petroleum hydrogen and they want us to develop calibrations and the idea behind the whole story is that once we can show that, uh, uh, that calibrations work or that they are realistic, this scanner will be mounted on a robotic system, it's, this is a cooperation with the Carnegie Mellon Institute in Pittsburgh. And uh, this robotic system, they are also involved, involved in the mass mission, can uh, grab soil samples, put it in a cup, measure it with our, uh, with our scanner, and based on the calibrations, they can predict how much TPH is in the soil. The idea behind this twofold. The so one is exploration. So you go to a new site, they want to know, is it worthwhile to, uh, to explore here? Number one, if they leave a site and the site is uh, contaminated, they want to decontaminate. And for this purpose, you want to know the degree of contamination, so whether they can do it biologically, or whether they have to excavate. So this is the background. And uh, I think we could show that diffuse reflection is a good technique for this purpose. So this is a scanner. In our laboratory, we put the sample in a quartz cup and shift the quartz cup underneath and measure, yeah, you can call it bottom up, uh, in diffuse reflection. In order to check whether our calibrations are of value, we compare this to a benchtop instrument. And for this purpose, we take the same cup and we put the cup on an integrating sphere in a laboratory FDNIR instrument and measure from the bottom of the cup. So we have the same sample, same cup. The only difference is in this case, we measure directly on the soil. Uh, in this case, we measure through the quartz. These are the uh, 86 spectra uh, measured with the handheld instrument and uh, measured with the benchtop instrument. You see there is a much higher spectral resolution, of course, for the benchtop instrument. And the gray areas are the, is our approach to eliminate water. We want to get rid of moisture uh, influence. So we, we work with relatively narrow ranges. Uh, here's the first overtone, and here's a combination region of CH absorptions. These are the calibrations. So top is a handheld calibration. The RMSEs are in the range of 1000 ppm in both cases. And these are two we have measured more, but I didn't have much. Uh, in, in enough space. These are the uh, two test samples, which, which have, of course, not been included in the calibration. And these are the uh, absolute errors of the reference and the predictive value. So you see, we are in the range, in terms of error, we are in the range of a couple of hundred uh, PPMs, which is good for Chevron. That's what they approximately expect. 
What you also see, of course, we, we could do much better if they would give us soils which fill this gap between about 10,000 and about 20,000 uh, ppm. So, and they are working on that. So you see the IMSEs are, are given here and the predictions are given here. Another industrial application with a big uh, uh, company, Alcoa is an Australian company and they are exploring oxid. Oxid is a mixture of minerals, uh, of gypsum, permit, uh, diaspora, and all of them are aluminum hydroxides or aluminum, aluminum oxides, hydroxides. And this is the instrument, it was a Riavi. Uh, we have it without grip and uh, the sample is prepared here in a customized brass cup. And we measure in diffuse reflection. This is very often we try to combine with benchtop instruments in order to check the reality of our calibrations or the performance of our calibration. These are measurements with a Baruka instrument and it's two samples. One with a very high aluminum content and one with no aluminum. If we measure the same sample with the handheld instrument, and we compare the regions, you see the spectroscopic footprint is here. Of course, the spectral resolution is much lower. So the question is now, can we use these spectra in order to calibrate for aluminum? Now, aluminum does not have a spectroscopic footprint. I tell you what we measure. We measure the OH functionalities. That's our spectroscopic anchor we use in order to develop a calibration for aluminum. And this is a calibration. It's, it's not an, a, a calibration where I would say uh, I get completely excited, but it, it, it's an error of about 4%. So at least the company was happy. And we, we also measured test samples and uh, unfortunately now you don't see the, let me see, no, you, you, you can't see the, the relatively good uh, agreement, but you can see one thing. It's this first sample without aluminum. Whenever we had no aluminum, we found a negative aluminum prediction. Simply because obviously this sort of milled geological rock sample was not in the calibration. Now I come to a Chinese example, to an everyday example, where you and I would be interested maybe to check whether the product we bought is the product. In, in China, uh, silk quilts you use in the bed are very popular. And if you go to a, a famous Chinese internet portal, uh, Bao, it's called Bao Bao, you will find these quilts advertised for uh, 55 yen or almost 4,000 yen. So it's either $850 or $610. So it, it would be good to know what the difference is because they, what they do is they blend the silk either with polyester or with cotton. So uh, we developed a calibration for uh, silk cotton blends. And I should say the preparation, the preparation of these samples uh, was done in China. What they were doing, they were cutting threads of cotton and silk down to approximately 0.5 millimeters and blended them then by weight and it looked like a powder. So uh, I think only Chinese students can do this properly <laughs> and uh, patiently. <coughs> it would be very difficult <coughs> to ask for this sample preparation in Germany. 
So we measured these samples. It was 101 samples and uh, we used, let me see how many samples did we use as reference. Uh, I think we used about 20 samples as test samples to, to externally validate. So these are the different instruments. You see on the left is a, a patch top instrument. Uh, then there is our Neospectra scanner, the one we used also for the TPH measurements and the Biavi, the uh, spectral engines, and the new instrument from the Norix. So these are the spectra of pure silk, only pure silk and pure cotton. Uh, of the different instruments to show you the, the differences. So here you have the whole wavelength, NIR wavelength region. Here you have a very large one, and these are very small ones. This focuses, for instance, only on CH, and you also see that this is a very small region here and here. So these are the, the top, are the original spectra of the calibration samples. And these are the, pre the different pre-treatments. We tried different spectral pre-treatments and we eventually focused on those given here because they provided the best results. And these are the results where we summarize the pre-treatment, the number of factors. So if you look, the first two instruments need only two factors, which is quite good. Uh, the others need more, so the robustness of the calibration is certainly lower. And the uh, IMSE values are in the range from about 2% to 4% for the lowest sensitivity here. The RPT values are given here, they were, for my expectations, they were very high, even for this instrument with 7.5, it's quite a, a, a reasonable calibration. Another application directly in a carpet store. I've shown it, I think, in my last talk in, in Montpellier. Uh, this is not a store. It's a, as a person is an Iranian and he uh, restorates and he cleans carpets. So we went to him and said, uh, can you help us a little bit in terms of discriminating possible fakes? He said, yes, I can do it. So the question is, two, two carpets, they, for me, they looked like silk just to make the, uh, the long story short. Uh, I would have bought both a silk carpet. So we, we, we measured the front carpet and we compared it to silk reference. We had silk from China, reference silk, uh, and you can see it's clearly uh, genuine silk. Uh, we measured the carpet in the back this is a silk reference, and you can see already there is no agreement. But if you compare it to, to cotton reference, it looks not the same, but it looks very similar. Uh, Mercerized cotton is prepared by treating normal cotton with uh, sodium hydroxide. So you change the, in order to change the gloss, etc. So you change the hydrogen bonding structure. Of the, uh, of the uh, cotton. And uh, this is the reason why you have intensity differences, but the pans are all in the correct uh, positions. So you were, if you bought the uh, carpet in the back, you were cheated. Uh, we worked in the, in the field of uh, authenticating fish long ago, actually. It dates back for almost, almost 10 years. Uh, there was a, a, a report of a, a non-profit company, uh, Oceana, in the United States, and they tested 1,200 seafood samples across the United States, and two-thirds of them were not what they should be. So, in, in Germany, we have the Pangasius and the Tilapia. They are, have become quite popular. They are relatively cheap. But uh, the, the Pangasius comes from Vietnam. 
and uh, has a lot of uh, antibiotics and the tilapia comes from the Victoria Lake and the problem of the tilapia is that he eats up all the other fish. So eventually the Lake Victoria has only tilapia fish. So it would be good to make sure that this is not what I bought. And in general, it, it would be good to be able to discriminate expensive from cheap fish, which look very similar. So this is a, a red mullet, and that's the way how we, we measured. Actually, we measured both with skin and without skin. And uh, I went, we have a very good fish shop near our place, and I asked them, can you give me pairs of fish which look very similar, but which are different in price. And this is one of these pairs. I forgot to prepare the second fish a little bit in terms of his uh, fins here. Uh, these are the spectra of skin and after scaling them. And if you run a PCA analysis, you can see that you clearly, uh, if you measure with the skin, you can clearly separate them, whereas there is a slight overlap in the meat, so you, you, don't, you don't have to waste your time. And sometimes if you eat in a good restaurant, the, the, the waiter brings you the fish on ice, then you can say, just a second, you pull out your instrument, <laughs> and then you... <laughs> So we have done it with different fish, uh, and it, it, it works quite well. This is just a 2D uh, PCA, it works very well. We have uh, taken fish from different catches, from different regions, etc. So uh, it's very easy to discriminate them. So finally, a word of caution. Uh, as I told you, Many companies, many of these direct-to-consumer companies like Telspec, Sio, also uh, Bosch and Siemens, they advertise their instruments uh, by they, they take their scanner, they hold it, the distance irrelevant, uh, they measure, they send it to this cloud, and in seconds the answer comes back. So it, you have the feeling that uh, what they do in the laboratory, they must be stupid to, to, do, to involve so much work for calibrations, etc., and to spend time to measure the distance in order to make sure that you get to reproduce every spectrum. Some of their claims. Yeah, freshness of fruits and vegetables. Identification of pesticide residues. Now, you should know that uh, this is very low amount on fruits and vegetables. Identification of stains on textiles. For instance, Bosch shows that they have a polyester shirt, a clean one, and one with a red wine stain. Then they measure the red wine stain, they measure the clean one, they send it in the cloud, it comes back, red wine, then they take the mobile, it's, it's already uh, on, on, a, on a mobile phone, and then they control the washing machine. So the, the uh, shirt is given in the washing machine and, and they can smart home, they call it smart home. Uh, yeah, uh, unrealistic uh, accuracy for nutritional parameters. In my opinion, none of these can be fulfilled. And AI is not a micro method. You, I've calculated uh, if you take a, a millimeter or some, a, 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 a milliliter of red wine and put it on your shirt, I've calculated the amount of anthocyanin, which is a red dye in how much it is, it's PPM levels. Uh, for, for pesticides, it's PPB levels, and it's impossible. We have measured freshness of fruit, cucumber, tomatoes, etc. And just in only one, we have found a, a change after one week. But I tell you the truth, after one week, I don't need a handheld NIR spectrometer in order to see whether 
uh, a lemon is fresh or not. You just press it and yeah, you see stains on it already. So uh, so the problem is most of it is water if you measure it from outside because you want to measure it non-destructively. This is a pre-treatment. And see, this is a 3D PCA score plot of day one, day seven, and day 11. And this range in between, which is of interest, was completely mixed. We did not find any differences. We could not see a trend. Yeah, after seven days or after 11 days, as I said, I don't need that. I really don't need a, a, an instrument. We have contaminated cotton in, intentionally. Pure, uh, clean cotton, cotton with coffee, cotton with fat. So if you look at the, the spectrum, this is cotton plus fat, cotton without fat. If you take the different spectrum, it's perfect. So fat, easy. Because the substance is so really everything stays if you have a red wine drop. 85% is water, it goes away. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's water, it goes away, and you have alcohol, it goes away, so the rest is PPM. Uh, cotton plus coffee, here we found no relation this is pure caffeine. We found no relation to, to caffeine. We could not detect the, the, the really the coffee stain. We could not uh, control our washing machine and say it's coffee. But what made fun was we, we had cotton plus red bull. We made a different spectrum. And the different spectrum is sugar. So, if you drink Red Bull, apart from the stimulants taurine, uh, you drink, a, a, you have a sugar solution. So I, I sacrificed blood from my finger and I contaminated cotton and it worked. You, and, uh, and blood is, is an, uh, would be good to be detected because it's difficult to remove. You see the specific uh, NH combination bands and overtones from the proteins in the, in the bloodstream. So this works. But the problem is that the non-experts of Bosch say it's much more popular to show a red wine because everybody drinks red wine and does not pick his finger and put blood on, on cotton. So uh, they, they have missed a chance in my opinion. So conclusions, uh, instead of getting misled by these uh, really very impressive advertisements of the direct to consumer companies, focus on realistic applications for everyday life. Avoid deception by internet sale of tablets, detect adulteration of spices, olive oil and other food products. Do not get cheated with textiles, carpets or tourist articles. For instance, ivory or amber. Ivory, if you go to a, a, a tourist place somewhere in Kenya, Tanzania, you may be terribly cheated. They sell you ivory and in actual fact, it's bone. It looks very, very simple. Screen nutritional parameters of food products, but do it in a realistic accuracy. And with this, I would like to acknowledge also people who have contributed and I thank you for your attention.